Who would, who would want to kill Diana and Dodie? Let me who just... would benefit? Give me a motive. Let's just go along with uh, what Michael Cole might be saying, whatever his, his opinions are, and the Jeffrey Steinberg school of thought, and this was, uh, this was something to do with security services. Who would sanction that? Well, it's nonsense. I think these conspiracy theories are frankly ludicrous. Why have the French authorities over, I, mean, I think, I think J Jeffrey Steinberg mentioned earlier on, nine, ten months this has been going on, and they have so signally failed to trace this well, car. Why do you say they failed? Why do you say they failed? You haven't seen what, what they're doing. Well, where Just is the car? Just because they failed to put a report on the table that satisfies you. The fact is that conspiracy theory is highly commercial. Conspiracy theory. So now you're a, you're a noted conspiracy theorist yourself. Why can't you get out of 007 land? Welcome to a very special edition of EIR Talks, dedicated to the death of Britain's Princess Diana. It's June 11th, 1998. My name is Tony Pappert. And our guest today is EIR counterintelligence director Jeff Steinberg, who's an internationally recognized authority on the death of Princess Diana, Diana last year. We're going to cover this story in five parts. First of all, the ongoing controversy today. Second, what really happened in the tunnel under Paris last year. Third, the question of motives. Fourth, the cover-up. And last, what comes next. Jeff, I know there have been four major attacks against Lyndon LaRouche, EIR magazine, and you personally in major British media over the past week. The occasion was competing TV broadcasts on the murder of Princess, or on the death of Princess Diana, which have revived deep political fissures in London over just what happened in Paris last August and what should be done about it. You were there. Please tell us about it. Well, I was in, Par uh, I was in London and in Nottingham, England uh, last week at the invitation of uh, Independent Television Network, which on Wednesday night, June the 3rd, aired a one-hour documentary presenting some rather dramatic new evidence suggesting that Princess Diana, Dodi Fayed, and Henri Paul were murdered through a sophisticated vehicular homicide attack and were not merely the victims of the alleged drunk driving by Henri Paul. Now, uh, after that documentary, which was seen by more than 12 and a half million British households, there was a live TV interview debate uh, in which I participated. The next night, Thursday evening, June 4th, uh, the second national independent television station in Britain called Channel 4 ran their own documentary which was aimed at trashing any notion that there was more to this story than merely tragic drunk driving. And in particular, that documentary zeroed in on Mohammed Al-Fayed, the father of the late Dodi Fayed, and Lyndon LaRouche, basically right. saying that everything that went on by way of allegations of conspiracy was really just simply uh, either the outgrowth of Mohammed Al-Fayed's lurid fantasies or those of Lyndon LaRouche. Now, the fact of the matter is that nine months after the crash, the chief investigating magistrate in Paris is still not satisfied that he has answered all of the critical questions that have to be answered before the case can be closed. Right. He had an extraordinary meeting of witnesses in Paris on June 5th. Al-Fayed attended that. The paparazzi who stand potentially accused of at least manslaughter in the death of Diana uh, were interrogated intensively. So clearly, despite the wishes of the British monarchy and the French establishment to have this case written off as tragic drunk driving, the judge doesn't see it that way, and furthermore, Executive Intelligence Review has published extraordinary documentation from literally the moment of the crash, right. proving that the evidence far more points towards premeditated murder than any other explanation. Now, I think it's very important to realize that the personality of Lyndon LaRouche has been a central figure in the fight that you referenced earlier among various factions of the British establishment. And the fact that after uh, many years of LaRouche being a pivotal player in that struggle, right. that now we're seeing overt slanders coming out against LaRouche 
indicates that we're truly moving into a very significant new moment in the fight within Britain and the controversy over the murder of Princess Diana. Four major slanders appeared in British media last week against Lyndon LaRouche, EIR, and EIR counterintelligence director Jeff Steinberg. Let's look at one of them now, part of a documentary which aired on Britain's Channel 4 last Thursday. Looking at something that really should not be characterized as a traffic accident case, but ought to be characterized as an investigation uh, into something that, in my view, looks like a murder. The idea of a plot has gained currency throughout the world. There are special conspiracy websites on the internet. In Egypt, a lawyer is taking Prince Philip and MI6 to court, accusing them of ordering a double contract killing. And the plot idea is endlessly promoted by Al Fayed. Michael Cole, his spokesman who retired in February, suggested that we talk to this man. Jeffrey Steinberg, chief reporter for a US magazine called Executive Intelligence Review. He even believes that the preposterous Prince Philip theory could be true. Now, I'm not saying that I've got anything even remotely resembling smoking gun proof that Prince Philip uh, called the shot and ordered British intelligence to do it, not by a long shot. But I'm saying that looking at his background, looking at the fact that several news reports indicated that he was livid over the idea of this relationship and was in fact livid over the fact that Diana had become a very significant thorn in the side of the House of Windsor. Uh, certainly creates a circumstance where uh, I can't rule it out, in all honesty. Tony, for the record, I was interviewed by Channel 4 TV uh, in April of this year uh, for more than two hours. Uh, I went through the entire evidence for the murder thesis. Uh, and it's very instructive that out of that entire two-hour interview, they chose to only air the segment dealing with Prince Philip. Interesting. Now, this gets to the heart of the controversy and why Lyndon LaRouche is presently at the very center of the battle over the future fate of the British establishment, the British oligarchy in the House of Windsor. Right. In November 1994, uh, Lyndon LaRouche wrote two extensive essays that were included in a special EIR cover story report called The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor, in which we particularly documented the murderous role of Prince Philip, the royal consort, in Africa and in many other parts of the world. Right. We took Prince Philip at his own words in an interview that he gave several years ago to the German National News Agency where he said that he hoped, if he is reincarnated, to be reincarnated as a deadly virus so he can contribute to the depopulating of this planet. So Prince Philip is not merely someone who fantasizes about mass murder and genocide. He's been one of the world's leading practitioners of that in the recent decades. And this has been a focus of EIR attention for the last uh, four years. Now, the policy of the British monarchy and their extended oligarchy known as the Club of the Isles, up until the beginning of June of this year, had been to ignore LaRouche, to black him out of the press, and therefore pretend that if he's not visible, maybe he'll go away. Well, events have clearly changed, and I think the fact that the controversy around the death of Princess Diana, the murder of Princess Diana, is now about to go into a new phase with the escalating investigation in Paris, with the run-up to the first anniversary of her death, August 31st of this year. Right. Um, this is going to be a subject of enormous attention. It's noteworthy that the uh, British population, by an overwhelming majority, is convinced that she was murdered. And this has major implications for the survival of the House of Windsor. Now, it's also important to note that you mentioned four major slanders of LaRouche, EIR, and me personally in the last week. In addition to the, I, uh, the Channel 4 TV show itself, the first of those slanders was an article that appeared on Thursday, June 4th in the Daily Telegraph in London. That article, apart from the ludicrous content, 
was significant because the author of the article was Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Now, Pritchard was sent by the Hollinger Corporation, which is the British monarchy's favorite media cartel, to Washington, D.C., immediately after the 1992 presidential elections. He was on assignment and admitted openly that he worked closely with British intelligence MI6 for the purpose of destroying the Clinton presidency. EIR exposed that beginning in 1993, and we also emphasized repeatedly that every enemy of President Clinton had already been a long-standing declared enemy of Lyndon LaRouche, and that the people behind the frame-up of Lyndon LaRouche were behind Clinton Gate. Right. And Ambrose Evans Pritchard personified the British apparatus behind Clinton Gate. So the fact that Pritchard was trotted out this past week and the Hollinger Corporation standing behind him right. in the pages of the Daily Telegraph to publish a scurrilous but absurd slander against LaRouche and EIR, a new Federalist newspaper, uh, is to my mind an indication that the British monarchy, the British establishment, are losing it and that they're in a mode of absolute panic at this point over the fact that uh, the Diana case is putting the spotlight on the still unraveling of the House of Windsor that has major ramifications for world politics, for the fate of the British Empire, and of course for world affairs more broadly given the global financial crisis and the other pressing issues on the table for all world leaders today. So the LaRouche issue is now center stage, uh, hotly debated within the British establishment, within the British oligarchy, and Prince Philip is clearly in a murderous rage. Jeff, after more than nine months of investigation, there are still more questions than answers in Diana's death. Can you th cut through the confusion and tell our readers what actually happened, tell our listeners what actually happened? You've been on the story since day one. Well, I think it's important to just simply follow the trail of evidence as to what happened in Paris from about 3 o'clock in the afternoon of uh, August the 30th, 1997, which is when the private jet carrying Princess Diana and Dodi Fayed from a vacation in Sardinia to a brief stopover in Paris landed at Le Breguet Airport. And let's just follow the known facts through the course of the day, because I think that alone sets a certain framework for being able to then zero in on what occurred in the tunnel. Right. Now, Princess Diana had been, over the previous months, through the summer of 1997, uh, increasingly upset at the intensity of the harassment coming from the paparazzi, the photojournalists, who basically stalked her whenever she appeared in public. When she was married to Prince Charles, was a member of the royal family, there was a degree of civility in the way that the paparazzi treated her. Right. But once the divorce was finalized in particular, uh, she confided to a number of her close friends that the attitude of the paparazzi shifted overnight and she suddenly became a target of near constant harassment. It was very clear, and some of the paparazzi acknowledged it, that they were receiving advance information from British intelligence on her uh, travel schedule, on her whereabouts, whenever she was to appear in public. In fact, this is one of the factors that prompted Diana uh, to both uh, sever her ties to the official security that she would have been entitled to as a former member of the British royal family right. by marriage. Uh, this also prompted her to make comments to a number of friends that she suspected that at some point she would go up in a helicopter and that MI5 or MI6 would somehow or other be involved and that she'd never come down alive. Right. But on the day of August 30th, at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, Diana and Dodie arrived in Paris at Le Breguet Airport. From the point that they arrived in the airport and landed, they were already being swarmed by paparazzi. Uh, they got into the Mercedes uh, bulletproof limousine that uh, was normally their travel vehicle. It was followed by a trail car, a Land Rover, carrying their luggage and one of the security guards. That Land Rover was driven, by the way, by Henri Paul, 
the deputy security director, in fact, acting security director of the Ritz Hotel, a very prestigious Paris hotel owned by Mohammed Al-Fayed. They were given a police escort only to the exit of the airport. And from that point on, right up through the crash, there was never any other French security, French police presence, at least visible presence, for the rest of the day. Uh, to my mind, this in and of itself is an absolute travesty. Right. Uh, the French government knew that Diana was arriving in France, was traveling with Dodi Fayed, yet there was no effort made to provide any kind of extra security, whether it was requested or not. She was one of the world's most famous personalities and one of the world's most endangered personalities, yet the French were gone from the scene from the moment that she arrived. At the exit of Le Breguet Airport, immediately a swarm of paparazzi in cars and high-speed motorcycles picked up on the Mercedes and the Land Rover. And in the drive into Paris, you already had the first near serious traffic incident when a dark-colored Peugeot carrying several of presumably the paparazzi sped by and cut off the Mercedes, uh, jammed on the brakes, nearly causing a collision, but allowing the paparazzi on motorcycles and in other cars uh, to drive by and take photographs. My gosh. Uh, about an hour later, when Diana and Dodi had stopped in Paris uh, on the Champs-Élysées, one of their security spotted that dark-colored Peugeot, confronted the driver, and the driver was absolutely brazen about the fact that they hadn't seen anything yet. In other words, there were overt threats from the paparazzi that they had every intention of making Diana and Dodi's life absolutely miserable for the entire time that they were in Paris. Right. So uh, you've got already from the very outset a situation in which at least the paparazzi and who knows who else was in that environment right. uh, uh, carrying out what amounted to a kind of a dry run vehicular attack against the couple and this was just the beginning. Diana and Doty went to the Ritz Hotel uh, by uh, mid-afternoon after a few other stops and when they arrived at the Ritz Hotel there was again a phalanx of highly aggressive paparazzi waiting there for their arrival and this was merely a sort of a foretaste of what was to come later. They went up to the second floor to the Imperial Suite which is right above the lobby and basically they spent the next uh, approximately two, two and a half hours at the Ritz Hotel. At that point, given the uh, intensity of harassment by the paparazzi, uh, Dodi and Diana decided to slip out the back exit of the hotel, uh, the employee's exit, uh, on the uh, Rue Cambron, which is a narrow one-way street uh, in the rear of the hotel. And uh, they got into the cars. They went off to uh, Dodi Fayed's apartment near the Champs-Élysées. Uh, about five miles away from the Ritz Hotel. Again, when they arrived at the apartment, fortunately one of the Ritz Hotel security people had been posted there uh, from the moment that they arrived at the airport at three in the afternoon. And again, before they arrived, there was a large group of paparazzi gathered outside, extremely aggressive. Uh, there were threats made by some of those paparazzi that if they didn't allow uh, them to get close access to Diana and Doty, that they would call in the British paparazzi who are presumably even more virulently aggressive and uh, hateful of Diana. So you had a yet another security incident as they tried to get past the paparazzi into Doty's apartment. Right. So we're now at about 7 o'clock in the evening of August 30th. At this point, Henri Paul, who had been on duty for the entire day, remember we saw that he was driving the trail car from Le Breguet Airport into the city. Right. For the first time all day, Henri Paul left the hotel and presumed that Diana and Doty were not going to be coming back to the Ritz that night at all and assumed he was basically off duty. Right. 
That situation lasted for no more than an hour and a half, two hours at the most, because when Diana and Dodie left the apartment, they went out to dinner intending to dine at a restaurant in central Paris. But once again, when they were getting close to the restaurant, they found that, again, a large group, very aggressive, hopped up paparazzi, were staked out waiting for them there. Right. And so they made a change in plans. They decided instead to go back to the Ritz Hotel and to dine. Initially, they thought about dining in the restaurant, but ultimately decided to go back up to the Imperial Suite. So it's about 9 o'clock that Diana and Doty arrive back at the Ritz Hotel. Henri Paul is called by one of the other security people and told that they're coming back to the hotel for the evening. Uh, whatever he was doing for that hour and a half period, he dropped it and raced back to the hotel. And we see uh, film footage from the closed circuit TV cameras in front of the Ritz Hotel, inside the hotel, throughout the next three hour period from about 9 p.m. until midnight. Right. And nowhere in that film footage is there any evidence that Henri Paul is drunk in any way, shape, or form. Diana go back up to the Imperial Suite and spend the next three hours there. Now, it's noteworthy that at least at this point, perhaps earlier, but at least at this point, in addition to the paparazzi, there are at least seven other still unidentified people who take up surveillance positions outside the front of the Ritz Hotel in the Place Vendôme. Right. Uh, two people, English speaking, are seated in the bar in the front lobby of the hotel. Several other people, uh, ostensibly paparazzi, but in fact not part of the well-known crew of paparazzi that are registered with the agencies and with the police in Paris, right. are roaming through the lobby of the hotel, eyeballing the security. And there's critically one additional unidentified, unknown person staked out in the Rue Cambon at the rear of the hotel. The Executive Intelligence Review published exclusive photographs of two of those still unidentified men standing in the Place Vendôme in front of the Ritz Hotel. So now we're raising the question of whether or not, in addition to the paparazzi, there was some other surveillance there in the environment during that evening. Right. Was it MI6? There have been questions raised uh, as the result of news coverage in the British press suggesting that the monarchy had ordered MI6 to prepare a full surveillance report and dossier of the Al-Fayed family, Dodi Fayed, and his relationship to Diana. Right. So these are among the still burning unanswered questions in this case. At about midnight, Diana and Dodi decided to leave the Ritz Hotel. Dodi made a command decision which ultimately proved to be a tragic error. He decided that rather than leaving through the front door and fighting through the phalanx of paparazzi, uh, that he would run a bit of a deception. He ordered one of his two key security guards, Kess Wingfield, to remain behind and to give the impression to the paparazzi out in front of the hotel that uh, they were going to be coming down, getting into the Mercedes, trailed by the Land Rover, and leaving through the front door. In the meantime, a second car, a backup car with no particular special security in it, uh, a Mercedes 280S, was brought up to the rear of the hotel. And the second bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, along with Princess Diana and Dodie Fayed, uh, left quietly, exited by the employee's entrance, right. and got into this single Mercedes a little bit after midnight at the rear of the hotel and drove off. Now what happened at that point is that surveillance cameras at the back of the Ritz Hotel, both Ritz Hotel surveillance cameras and some of the adjacent buildings, showed that at the moment that Diana and Doty and Henri Paul and Trevor Reese Jones got into that Mercedes 280S, you see a figure standing across the street slightly down from the exit of the hotel, immediately getting onto a cell phone and placing a call. Unfortunately, 
The camera shot is blurry. It's looking down from above. You really can't make out any distinguishing features of the individual, just a sort of a shadow uh, getting onto a uh, cellular phone. Right. Um, I think it would be a mistake to merely presume that the phone call at that point went out just to the paparazzi. We don't know. Uh, the question is whether or not the Paris police in some way have an ability to track right. that telephone call. They deny it, at least publicly, but uh, such technologies do exist. So perhaps someday we'll know who that person was. The fact is, however, that from the moment that they pulled out from the rear of the Ritz Hotel, there was a small white car, perhaps the uh, critical Fiat Uno, there was a motorcycle, and several other vehicles tailing immediately behind them. And shortly after that, a number of other cars and motorcycles joined in the chase, according to a number of eyewitnesses. Now, Henri Paul uh, drove the car through a few uh, Paris streets and then cut down to the river road that runs along the right bank of the Seine River. Right. Uh, this is not the most direct route to get to Doty's apartment, but it's a route that's frequently used to avoid traffic lights where you're basically stuck in a paparazzi trap. Mm -hmm. So Henri Paul got onto that river road about a mile and a half before the Place de Alma tunnel. According to every eyewitness account that's been made public, uh, he was driving at about 60 miles an hour, which is a fast but safe speed on that highway and was being harassed by a number of vehicles, motorcycles, cars, in the race into the Place de Alma tunnel. Now, a new witness has come forward just in recent days who shed some extraordinary light on the role of the mysterious Fiat Uno. It's a highly credible witness, a man named David Laurent, who is a senior official of the French police. He was off duty shortly after midnight the very early moments of August 31st, 1997. He was driving somewhat ahead of the Mercedes and the swarm of cars and motorcycles chasing on that river road. And at a certain point, he says that he was passed at high speeds by a white Fiat Uno. Right. Yet, a second or two later, as he arrived at the entrance to the Place de Alma tunnel, he saw that same Fiat Uno practically at a full stop right near the entrance to the tunnel. He drove on, not thinking a great deal about it. Less than a minute later, perhaps 30 seconds later, he heard a resounding explosion noise, which was the crash inside the tunnel. So now, David Lawrence's testimony suggests that the Fiat Uno was waiting. was waiting for the Mercedes to arrive at that designated point. We know that Henri Paul had intended to exit at the Place de Alma and not go into that tunnel. But we know also that there were motorcycles and cars surrounding him. He was going too fast at that point to be able to turn off. And furthermore, one eyewitness, Brenda Wells, says that she saw the Fiat Uno basically blocking the exit at the Place de Alma. So we've got four or five eyewitnesses who all have remarkably similar accounts of this very tight sequence of events right at the entrance to the tunnel. Right. What we do know is that there was a collision between that Fiat Uno and the Mercedes, and that the collision was the cause of the fatal crash into the 13th pillar in the tunnel, which instantly killed driver Henri Paul, instantly killed Dodi Fayed, and seriously injured Princess Diana and Trevor Reese Jones. The Fiat sped out of the tunnel. We've got eyewitnesses who were on the road feeding out of the Place de Alma tunnel who said they nearly had a collision with the Fiat Uno that was speeding away, giving clearly the impression it was trying to get away from the scene of the explosion in the tunnel. Right. At least one motorcycle also sped off and also disappeared from sight. Now we have a witness, again a credible witness, a British attorney named Gary Hunter, who with his wife was staying at a hotel several blocks from the crash site. He didn't have a line of vision into the tunnel, but he told the French police, he told American news people, about a minute or two later, he saw a small light-colored car 
followed by a larger car, which he thought was a Mercedes, speeding down that narrow street at more than 70 miles an hour. And he, too, had the impression that those cars were trying to escape from whatever the loud explosion noise was in the tunnel. Right. The Fiat Uno, nine months later, is still missing from the face of the earth. There's been no identification of the driver, despite what one must assume was the most aggressive manhunt, perhaps, uh, in modern history for a car and a driver. Now, we're now back at the tunnel. Uh, we've got other eyewitnesses who uh, not only corroborated the role of the Fiat Uno and later forensic evidence that showed scratch marks on the side of the Mercedes revealed that there was definitely a collision with a Fiat Uno that was manufactured sometime between 1984 and 1987. It was a turbo model, meaning a model that even though it was a small car, was a powerful car capable of speeding away, avoiding being caught up in the collision. Right. Uh, the police, moments after the crash, found fragments of the rear headlight of a car that they later confirmed was a Fiat Uno. So we have here not an out of control drunk driving situation, but we have a collision with a second car, which with no plausible explanation, disappeared from the crash site and subsequently disappeared from the face of the earth. Jeff, anyone who questions, as you have, whether this was a simple traffic accident is hit with the blood test of Henri Paul, taken shortly after the accident, apparently, which showed a high level of alcohol and simultaneous intoxication with two prescription drugs. And so, as, as you well know, this has been the basis for uh, discrediting uh, views of the case such as your own and claiming it's a simple test of drunken driving. What's the true story of that blood test? Well, first of all, be, be aware that the only evidence, the only credible evidence of Henri Paul being drunk was that blood test. So an enormous amount of the investigation hangs or falls on the status of that blood test. Right. This was perhaps the only thing in the entire course of this in investigation that was rushed to be taken care of. Within about an hour or two after the crash, forensic pathologists at the morgue in Paris took blood tests of Henri Paul. And a day or two later came leaks to the French press from the police that Henri Paul was three times over the legal alcohol level. Henri Paul's parents reacted angrily. They rejected the idea that their son would have been involved in a drunk driving incident like this. They insisted on the right to take further independent blood tests and more in-depth autopsy. That was rejected by the French police. In fact, ultimately, the body was released days later, only under the condition that they would do no other blood tests. What they were given was a physical copy of the written report of the original forensic tests, the post-mortem. Right. Some of the world's leading forensic pathologists reviewed those physical reports and were horrified at the incompetence with which the blood samples were taken. And on the face of it, the blood samples were all taken from Henri Paul's chest cavity, if we're even to believe that the blood samples came from Henri Paul. And you'll see why I say that in a moment. Uh, the blood tests taken from the chest cavity were hopelessly contaminated because his entire chest had been uh, crunched in the crash. Uh, his vital organs had burst open. It was not a blood sample. It was a combination of stomach bile, blood. He had had one or two drinks over the course of the day. So that alone is a factor that contaminates the blood sample. Right. But critically, separate from the post-mortem, a pathologist at the French police headquarters tested the same blood sample and found that there were near lethal doses of carbon monoxide found in the bloodstream. Yet Dodi Fayette, who also died instantly in the same car, showed no traces of carbon monoxide. Now, if Dodi Fayette had been poisoned with carbon monoxide, I'm sorry, if Henri Paul had been poisoned with carbon monoxide right. earlier in the evening, then he would have been unable to walk straight. He would have been suffering from a throbbing headache that would have been almost uncontrollable pain. He would have had no sense of balance, no sense of distance perspective. He could have barely gotten behind the wheel of that Mercedes and driven a block, nevertheless, uh, engaged in fairly 
complicated and effective driving along that five or ten minute drive into the tunnel. The uh, film footage from inside the Ritz Hotel shows no evidence of carbon monoxide poisoning. And so the question has now been raised whether or not the blood sample that purports to show that Henri Paul was drunk at the time of the crash was even a blood sample from Henri Paul. There were a dozen other uh, corpses in the morgue the night that Henri Paul was brought in, and at least one person, the uh, host of the ITV documentary, raised the question of whether perhaps it was a phony blood sample to begin with. So the whole issue of Henri Paul being drunk is a dubious proposition at best, and frankly, I believe, is now thoroughly discredited. Britain's ITV documentary last Wednesday gave a lot of uh, attention to the possibility that a military-style laser was used to blind Henri Paul, the driver of the Mercedes. Let's look at that footage now. And it's then that I see that once the flash happens, the Mercedes goes left, right, left. Initially, Francois Levistre was dismissed by the French police, but in fact, we have established that last month he was called in by the judge to give his account of events. Many other witnesses have also described the motorbike and some the very bright flash in the tunnel. So we set up an experiment for Francois Levistre. Now, Monsieur Levistre, there will be two flashes. Yeah. Behind you here. The distance, I think, will be just about the distance you say when there was a flash in the tunnel that night. Mm -hmm. So if you look out carefully here. No. That's the first one. Yeah. And now wait, we should see another one coming up. Yeah. Yeah. That second, second one. Yeah. That the was second the second one. The second yeah, one. yeah, sure. You're absolutely certain. Yeah, sure. Sure. So what was that blinding light Monsieur Levistre claimed he saw in that tunnel? In the demonstration you've just seen, the first flash came from this paparazzi's camera. But Monsieur Levistre identified the much bigger flash, the second one, and that came from this piece of kit. Now this is an anti-personnel device, quite legal to buy in the UK, which sets off one enormously powerful flash of light. Shine this in somebody's eyes and they'll be stunned disabled, blinded for several minutes. If you're driving a car when it happens, you'll almost certainly crash. We bought our anti-personnel flashlight in the West End of London for just over 260 pounds. But there's another version of this kit. It's not available to the public. It's infinitely more powerful, and it's used by army special forces, including the British, around the world. Jeff, if I recall, it was Lyndon LaRouche who first raised this as a possibility that had to be investigated within days of Princess Diana's death. That's right. Uh, not only uh, Le Viste, but several other witnesses uh, had mentioned this blinding flash of light in the tunnel. Uh, there were photographs taken, apparently, by one of the paparazzi whose film was seized by the police that also indicated... Uh, Henri Paul being uh, stunned by a bright light. Uh, even you saw the uh, bodyguard, Trevor Reese Jones, in the front seat flipping down the sun visor, even though it's after midnight at night. Right. And on the basis of that, uh, Lyndon LaRouche raised the question, if we're looking here at the possibility of a sophisticated vehicular murder in which the purpose was to make sure that Princess Diana and Dodi Faya did not survive, then what kinds of technologies might be brought to bear? We began looking into this laser question as soon as Mr. LaRouche raised the issue. And one rather startling thing that we discovered was that in 1993, the International Committee of the Red Cross had published an extensive study uh, in which they were launching a campaign calling for the banning of anti-personnel lasers right. use in combat and particularly against civilian populations. They held a series of three technical symposia which were transcribed in the report. There were articles in a number of military journals, non-classified, discussing incidents where both French and British special services had used these kinds of military lasers in Somalia, in the Balkans, 
in the Middle East during the Operation Desert Storm. And so the question was very much in the forefront. And I think the footage that was shown on the ITV broadcast certainly lends further credence to the idea that this may have been yet another factor. Now, the point is that if you're hit by one of these lasers, uh, the first effect is that you're blinded. If the laser is tuned very high, then uh, you may be permanently blinded. But that can be adjusted to where there's temporary damage, which would not even show up necessarily in an autopsy or a serious right. medical check. The second thing that happens is with a powerful enough blast of one of these lasers is that the individual is stung with tremendous pain. Basically, the optical nerves are hit with this tremendous burst of light, and you're temporarily paralyzed as well as blinded. So certainly, uh, this is at least a possibility that urgently needs to be explored before this case is closed. One final question about the crash. You've written in EIR that if Princess Diana had received timely and proper medical care, she would still be alive today. Could you b expand briefly on the significance of that? This is also a very important aspect of the story, and I should add that in May of this year, Judge Stefan ordered a complete review of the emergency medical care that was given to the princess from the point of the crash. Now, what happened? Uh, first of all, it took approximately 16 minutes from the point that the crash occurred for the first emergency vehicles to arrive on the scene, fire trucks and ambulances. From the moment that they arrived, 16 minutes after the crash, it took more than one hour for Princess Diana to be put into the ambulance and for the ambulance to leave the tunnel and route to a hospital. To leave the tunnel? It took one hour before the ambulance left the tunnel from the point the ambulance arrived 16 minutes after the crash. From the point the ambulance left the tunnel, it took 43 minutes to drive all of four miles to the Lepite Salpetriere Hospital. At one point, the ambulance was 500 yards from the emergency entrance to the hospital and pulled over on the side of the road and stood parked there for 10 minutes. Now, there have been many explanations given for why it took so long, and none of them hold up to the test of what would be of appropriate medical care, whether it was in France or anywhere else in the world. The fact is that an emergency medical doctor coming home from a party named Frederick Maillet happened by the crash site three minutes after the crash. He immediately diagnosed that Princess Diana was still alive. He initially told reporters and wrote to a medical journal that he felt fully confident that she would survive the crash. But he realized that she was suffering from internal hemorrhaging. Now, whether you're in Paris, France, or you're on the moon, if you're suffering from internal bleeding, the only course of action is to be immediately gotten into surgery to right. repair the damaged veins and arteries, provide new blood, and hopefully survive. Right. The danger always is that you wait too long and the person bleeds to death. So one hour and 43 minutes later, uh, Princess Diana bled to death just before she was brought into the emergency room. EIR interviewed one of the people who created the emergency medical system in Paris, a prominent doctor who was horrified, who said that by all rights, particularly given that Princess Diana's identity was known from the very outset, she should have been brought to the Val de Gras Hospital, a military hospital much closer to the tunnel. There's a medevac helicopter that could have been brought in right to the entrance to the tunnel. And this doctor's estimate is that Princess Diana should have been in surgery within 25 minutes after the first arrival of the fire trucks and emergency vehicles. And from that moment on, the likelihood of her surviving would have been extremely high. Right. So these are mitigating circumstances that also are now very much in Judge Stefan's spotlight. Let's move to the question of motives. If this was not just a simple traffic accident, as you're saying, the question always comes up is, what is the motive? Who could conceivably want to kill Princess Diana? You were asked this in London, and here's how you responded. But Jeffrey Steinberg, you were trying to come in earlier on, and Rosemary Byrne there was talking about conspiracy theories. There are a lot of conspiracy theories. Many people find them very offensive. Now, you're a, you're a noted conspiracy theorist yourself. Why can't you get out of 007 land, come into the realms of reality, and acknowledge that 
this woman, Diana, Princess of Wales, was killed by a drunken driver. Let me start out by saying one no, thing. No, let me start, I, let me start I, out by answering the question. <laughs> well, because, number one, I dispute the fact that it was a drunk driving. Number two, nine months after the fact, the chief investigating magistrate who's got access to presumably every bit of the investigation is not yet satisfied and is not prepared to close the investigation. Okay. In fact, Friday, he's calling many of the eyewitnesses that have been trashed by Martin and the other the woman from Channel 4, who, by the way, uh, okay, if they're going to have Bob Lawson... Sure, take it the... further, but Michael Cole, answer this point. I want you to as well. Give me a motive. Okay, very simple. In 1995, November, Princess Diana went on national television. It was probably the most widely watched show in Britain, saying that Prince Charles was unqualified to be king, launching an attack against the House of Windsor that struck a very strong chord in the minds of many people in Britain, and so, this is right. not a okay, this is okay. not a so are opera. you pointing your finger at the heart, the sinister heart of the British establishment? I'm answering your question. You said, is Where there a conceivable motive? Where are you pointing your finger? I'm, I'm saying that after, after Princess Diana launched that attack, I read the English press, I read the commentaries from the city establishment, news commentators, and they basically said, off with her head. So, to say that there's absolutely no conceivable motive in the Sir world Bernadine, is, to my what mind, What do you say absurd. to Jeffrey Steinberg? I think I'm living in a lunatic asylum here. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, I think that's all this is. The fact is that conspiracy theory, and I'm sorry that Nick Owen has lent himself to our fired fantasies, but the fact is that conspiracy theory is highly commercial, and that program that we've seen proves nothing at all. It's very useful, though, in hanging adverts every 20 minutes. But surely, but surely, and that's how... To be fair to... To be fair to, uh, to, be fair to our representatives of uh, ITV programming, or indeed, to, to those from Channel 4, that is how we pay the bills. But well, she you did have you her enemies. not pay the bills she at did the have, expense she of did two have her enemies, princes. did she not, Sir Bernard? Yeah, yeah. Did she have her enemies? Yeah. Uh, not, I don't think they were lethal enemies at all. They had, she had her serious critics, and I was one of them. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> what about Tiny Robots? Well, let me just say a very important point. The criticism that the ITV show was somehow an Al Fayed put up, I've got a question of whether tomorrow night show is going to be a Tiny Roland put up because seeing that Bob Loftus, who's under Scotland Yard investigation, is going to be trotted forward is apparently a major source of information explaining why it is that there's no conspiracy All right. is rather bothersome to me. Interesting point. As as now, rather than playing attack television here, can you develop the question of the motive of the possible murderers of Diana? Yes, well, I, I think I got in at least a few words edgewise on that live TV debate, uh, but let me elaborate here. Much of the international media has attempted to treat the death of Princess Diana as soap opera. You've got two schools of thought, both fictional, uh, concerning the life of Princess Diana. One school of thought says that she was basically a younger, prettier version of Mother Teresa who was indeed a friend and collaborator of the princess. The other version is she was a crass, uh, soap opera, jet set figure uh, who was jumping from one affair to the next. Uh, the reality is quite different. And we know this very personally and intimately. When we published The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor in November of 1994, which was perhaps the most uh, extensive expose of the criminality, the murderous character of Prince Philip and the Windsors. We sent copies of that EIR to all of the members of the royal family. And uh, about a year later, we received a letter back, a personal letter from Princess Diana, thanking us for having sent her that material and expressing interest in some of the views that were included in that EIR package. We sent her further material on a wide range of subjects, including Mr. LaRouche's economic writings, our concerns about Africa, which was something that we very much shared with her. And in April of 1997, she wrote to us a second time, again expressing both her interest and her gratitude for receiving the material. Her personal secretary made it very clear that this was Princess Diana's personal wishes and also that Princess Diana considered these political issues to be of great interest uh, and that it was highly unusual for her to send several personal letters to someone outside of her immediate coterie of friends. 
So we had a, a certain view in advance of a very different Princess Diana. In fact, from 1990, as soon as she realized what a horribly dysfunctional family the Windsors actually were, uh, she began collaborating with a number of people, first with uh, investigative journalist Andrew Morton in preparing a book-length expose of the House of Windsor, which came out in 1992. Right. This, among other things, prompted Queen Elizabeth to describe that year as the horrible year, the Annus Horribilis. Uh, later, in, in November of 1995, as I indicated on the uh, TV debate, Princess Diana gave a famous interview to BBC Panorama. Right up to the moment of her funeral, it was the most widely watched TV broadcast in English history. In that broadcast, she stated bluntly that her estranged husband, Prince Charles, was unqualified to be the monarch. The reaction from the official city of London, particularly Tory press, was immediate, it was violent. They said, this woman has to go. There are precedents in English history for women like this making these kinds of statements and being disposed of rather violently. So that's 1995. Princess Diana continued on the attack on this issue of Prince Charles's absolute incompetence to serve as the monarch. And so implicitly, she was proposing that her eldest son, Prince William, immediately be considered as the regent replacing Queen Elizabeth. Right. Now, remember that Diana, being a member of the Spencer family, comes from a family that had been on the English throne long before the Windsors spoke their first word of English, long before the Windsors, earlier the Hanovers, came to England from Germany. And so she was speaking with a certain kind of historical authority. Right. She had also gathered around her, and in fact this was the reason for the Spencer Al-Fayed family collaboration, a number of other leading elements with the English within the English aristocracy, within the emerging wealthy class in Britain, among factions within the city of London, who considered the House of Windsor to be a disaster. There's a Republican movement in England which may or may not really deserve the term Republican, but which has been advocating the removal of the Windsors from the throne. So this is high politics. This is not low soap opera that we saw here. And therefore, the idea of reducing the question of motive merely to the question of whether or not Diana was about to marry Doty, who was a Muslim, right. who was dark-skinned, who was Egyptian, uh, really doesn't address the issue. Now, another important question comes up when you look at motives emerging from 1991, 1995. The implication of that is that there's ample time for professional teams to do adequate surveillance, profiling, developing of various alternative scenarios, putting teams in place, going through dry runs, the kinds of things that a professional intelligence service or even a private agency staffed by professionals would be able to do if you've got a period of time in which to plan out and stage such a thing. In other words, the point I'm making is that when you address the longer term question of motive, Right. then you begin to introduce also more possibilities of professional teams being involved. Right. Um, I think it's noteworthy that, again, on the ITV broadcast, uh, James Hewitt, a former boyfriend of Princess Diana after the breakup of her marriage with Prince Charles, stated on the camera that he had been threatened with murder by the British royal family for his involvement with the princess. I think maybe we might want to take a look at that footage yes, here for a second. Yes, let's watch that now. The telephone calls were anonymous. That left me in no doubt that um, they knew what the situation was. And... Um, were they threatening? Yes. They were. Um, in as much as they said that it was not conducive to my health to continue the relationship. James Hewitt says he also received warnings from Diana's personal police protection officers and members of the royal household. He says that he even had a conversation with a member of the royal family. Describe to me roughly how the conversation went. Um, words, similar words, um, words to the effect that um, 
you know, your relationship is known about. Um, it is not supported. Um, we cannot be responsible for your safety or security um, and suggest that you curtail it. That sort of thing. Forthwith. That sort of thing was said to you by a, at least one member of the royal family. By a member of the royal family. Jeff, you've alleged a cover up by the French police. Can you prove that? I think so, yes. Uh, first of all, I think it's important to differentiate between the French police. Uh, the criminal brigade of the French police was in charge of the investigation from the uh, very moment of the crash. I distinguish the performance of the criminal brigade from that of Judge Stefan, who is in charge of the overall investigation and who, uh, from everything that I can see and from what I've been told by some of our best sources in Paris, uh, seems to be making an honest go of getting to the truth in this case. However, the critical first phase from the day of the crash up through the end of December was in the hands of the criminal brigade. And they were caught flagrantly putting out a number of lies to their favored leaks within the French media. Those lies were absolutely critical to feeding the disinformation campaign around the drunk driving thesis and also covering up for the uh, murderous delay in getting Princess Diana to the hospital. Right. The very first thing that happened from the day of the crash is the French police lied, knowingly lied, claiming that Henri Paul was going at over 120 miles an hour right. at the point of the crash. And they claimed to have based that on the fact that the uh, speedometer in the car of the Mercedes was frozen at over 120 miles an hour. Now, EIR interviewed the safety engineers and design engineers at Daimler-Benz, and they just simply said, that's impossible. The car speedometer would have gone back to zero at the point of a crash, whether it was at 30 miles an hour or 130. Right. And later, two weeks later, the French police admitted, no, that information was wrong. It really read zero. So it was a flagrant lie intended to give the false impression that Henri Paul was driving at uncontrollable reckless speeds, right. completely false. And now some of the uh, simulations of the crash by forensic experts have further confirmed eyewitness accounts that the car was going at about 60 miles an hour. Secondly, when the question came up of the uh, tremendous delay in getting Princess Diana first into the ambulance and then onto the hospital, the French police again lied flagrantly claiming that the reason it took so long is that the rear compartment of the Mercedes was completely mangled and it took a major effort to get Princess Diana out of the back seat. You had visions of Texas chainsaws being used. Right. In point of fact, the side of the car where Diana was sitting, the rear compartment was pristine. There was no crash damage to speak of. In fact, the door was open. Paparazzi, including Romel Rott, one of the people who frightened Diana the most, that day in Paris, and who's one of the people potentially up on manslaughter charges, was in the back seat leaning all over Princess Diana when the first medical expert arrived on the th scene three minutes after the crash. Right. So a number of these things, the whole question of the blood sample of Henri Paul, uh, all were clear cases where the French police were categorically lying. There are many other examples that I'm aware of where the French police sabotaged potentially critically fruitful leads. For example, what I mentioned earlier, David Laurent, the French police official who saw the Fiat Uno. His testimony was taken by the French criminal brigade shortly after the crash, but was only provided to the magistrate, Stefan, in the last two weeks. So there's a widespread pattern that leads me to be very concerned. And furthermore, one of the critical points that Lyndon LaRouche insisted had to be known based on his understanding of how French society and French bureaucracy works was who was in charge at the crash site. Because France is a country of top-down hierarchical institutions. And what we found is that shortly after the crash, the police chief of Paris, Philippe Massoni, arrived at the tunnel and supervised the entirety of the rescue effort and the early phase of the crash investigation. The interior minister of France, Jean-Paul Chevenemont, 
was going to go to the tunnel, but in consultation with Massoni, decided instead to go to the P.T. Salpetriere Hospital. He was at the hospital an hour before Diana and was in regular contact with Massoni in the tunnel. So here you've got two of the highest ranking law enforcement officials of the French government, one right. being a cabinet minister, on the scene supervising the events. And so in effect, you've got a scandal here that could be the 20th century equivalent of the Dreyfus affair that could bring down the Jospin government. Right. So there's many reasons why the French would have bureaucratic interests, if nothing else, in covering it up. And this, of course, doesn't even address the question of collusion between British and French agencies in helping to orchestrate the vehicular attack and then the cover-up afterwards. These are all the questions that are on Judge Stefan's plate that we'll be dealing with consistently and that we have by no means heard the end of. And that leads us to our final topic, Jeff. What is going to happen next? Well, there was an extraordinary interview that took place on June 5th all day at the Palace of Justice in Paris. And this was a group confrontation directed by Judge Stefan of the nine paparazzi who may be prosecuted for their involvement. It was a cross-gridding of their stories with eyewitness accounts. And so there's much more to be done on this investigation. And the latest indications are that the final report, the final decision by Judge Stefan uh, as to whether or not to indict, whether to declare it an accident, whether to declare it a mystery in which there are a number of John Doe's still at large, for example, at least the driver of the Fiat Uno still right. missing. These questions are not going to be resolved until Christmas. In the meantime, we're now in mid-June. August 31st is the first anniversary of the crash. It is an absolute certainty that between now and August 31st, this issue is going to be in the forefront of the popular mind in France, in Britain, in the United States, in many countries around the world. Therefore, the fate of the House of Windsor and the French government very much hangs in the balance. And in a sense, Princess Diana, in her death, may prove to be the worst nightmare for the House of Windsor. And uh, I can only say that uh, Executive Intelligence Review, uh, Mr. LaRouche, myself, our staff of people in Paris, here in the United States and elsewhere, are absolutely committed to pursuing every last lead, every detail of this case. There's an issue here of truth and justice, which is an absolute question, which we are committed to and particularly in the interests of Princess Diana, uh, this is the least that one can ask of this case. Furthermore, we have in the United States long-standing experience with the murder of President Kennedy, right. with the murder of Martin Luther King, with the murder of Robert Kennedy, of Malcolm X. 35 years after the Kennedy assassination, because there was a cover-up by the Warren Commission, there are still more unanswered questions, there are still larger percentages of people who believe that it was a conspiracy beyond merely that involving lone assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. Right. Shortly after the Kennedy assassination, there were piles of bodies of key witnesses, dead, many through inexplicable reasons, many through sudden violence. And so the situation now is perhaps quite different. The forensic evidence, although some of, it, some of it has been tampered with, remains available. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, all of the key witnesses are still alive and available. There are thousands of pages of raw documents that were gathered up by the French police, probably many more leads that they ignored or chose to ignore that Judge Stefan, I suspect, is now pursuing. And so here we are in a situation where we can avoid by effective investigative action now and refusing to rush to judgment an opportunity to actually get the answers. There's only three possibilities in this case. Either the French authorities have it right and it was a garden variety case of tragic drunk driving, 
or secondly, it was a case of aggravated manslaughter brought about by the behavior of the paparazzi and perhaps others, but maybe not premeditated murder. Right. Or we have the evidence that it was sophisticated premeditated murder. Right. I, for one, completely rule out the first of those three possibilities based on the evidence already in hand. Mm -hmm. I lean very strongly to the third, but cannot rule out the possibility that it was the combined, aggravated, pre-ordered harassment right. by the paparazzi and perhaps others. Nevertheless, in either of those two possibilities, manslaughter or premeditated murder conspiracy, we are dealing with murder, murder of Princess Diana, one of the most important and beloved individuals of the late 20th century. And again, I say, let's not give up prematurely. Let's keep answering the tough questions, and let's make sure that truth and justice prevails. And I can promise that this is perhaps the best updated report that we can give as of the middle of June. But I can tell you that this is not the last that you'll be hearing from Executive Intelligence Review on this question. We're committed to following this story through to the end, and we can assure our readers and listeners that they'll be on board for that entire process. We took Prince Philip at his own words in an interview that he gave several years ago to the German National News Agency, where he said that he hoped, if he is reincarnated, to be reincarnated as a deadly virus so he can contribute to the depopulating of this planet. So Prince Philip is not merely someone who fantasizes about mass murder and genocide. He's been one of the world's leading practitioners of that in the recent decades. And this has been a focus of EIR attention for the last uh, four years. Now, the policy of the British monarchy and their extended oligarchy known as the Club of the Isles, up until the beginning of June of this year, had been to ignore LaRouche, to black him out of the press, and therefore pretend that if he's not visible, maybe he'll go away. Well, events have clearly changed, and I think the fact that the controversy around the death of Princess Diana, the murder of Princess Diana, is now about to go into a new phase with the escalating investigation in Paris, with the run-up to the first anniversary of her death, August 31st of this year, right. um, this is going to be a subject of enormous attention. It's noteworthy that the uh, British population, by an overwhelming majority, is convinced that she was murdered. And this has major implications for the survival of the House of Windsor. Now, it's also important to note that you mentioned four major slanders of LaRouche, EIR, and me personally in the last week. In addition to the, I, uh, the Channel 4 TV show itself, the first of those slanders was an article that appeared on Thursday, June 4th in the Daily Telegraph in London. That article, apart from the ludicrous content, was significant because the author of the article was Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Now, Pritchard was sent by the Hollinger Corporation, which is the British monarchy's favorite media cartel, to Washington, D.C., immediately after the 1992 presidential elections. He was on assignment and admitted openly that he worked closely with British intelligence MI6 for the purpose of destroying the Clinton presidency. EIR exposed that beginning in 1993, and we also emphasized repeatedly that every enemy of President Clinton had already been a long-standing declared enemy of Lyndon LaRouche, and that the people behind the frame-up of Lyndon LaRouche were behind Clinton Gate. Right. And Ambrose Evans Pritchard personified the British apparatus behind Clinton Gate. So the fact that Pritchard was trotted out this past week and the Hollinger Corporation standing behind him. Right in the pages of the Daily Telegraph to publish a scurrilous but absurd slander against LaRouche and EIR, a new Federalist newspaper, uh, is to my mind an indication that the British monarchy, the British establishment, are losing it and that they're in a mode of absolute panic at this point over the fact that uh, the Diana case is putting the spotlight on the still unraveling of the House of Windsor 
that has major ramifications for world politics for the fate of the british empire and of course for world affairs more broadly given the global financial crisis and the other pressing issues on the table for all world leaders today so the larouche issue is now center stage uh, hotly debated within the british establishment within the british oligarchy and prince philip is clearly in a murderous rage Jeff, after more than nine months of investigation there are still more questions than answers in diana's death can you thr cut through the confusion and tell our readers what actually happened to tell our listeners what actually happened you've been on the story since day one well, I think it's important to just simply follow the trail of evidence as to what happened in Paris from about 3 o'clock in the afternoon of uh, August the 30th, 1997, which is when the private jet carrying Princess Diana and Dodi Fayette from a vacation in Sardinia to a brief stopover in Paris landed at Le Breguet Airport. And let's just follow the known facts through the course of the day because I think that alone sets a certain framework for being able to then zero in on what occurred in the tunnel. Right. Now, Princess Diana had been over the previous months through the summer of 1997 uh, increasingly upset at the intensity of the harassment coming from the paparazzi, the photojournalists who basically stalked her whenever she appeared in public. When she was married to Prince Households, there was a live TV interview debate uh, in which I participated. The next night, Thursday evening, June 4th, uh, the second national independent television station in Britain called Channel 4 ran their own documentary which was aimed at trashing any notion that there was more to this story than merely tragic drunk driving. And in particular, that documentary zeroed in on Mohammed Al-Fayed, the father of the late Dodi Fayed, and Lyndon LaRouche, basically right. saying that everything that went on by way of allegations of conspiracy was really just simply uh, either the outgrowth of Mohammed Al-Fayed's lurid fantasies or those of Lyndon LaRouche. Now, the fact of the matter is that nine months after the crash, the chief investigating magistrate in Paris is still not satisfied that he has answered all of the critical questions that have to be answered before the case can be closed. Right. He had an extraordinary meeting of witnesses in Paris on June 5th. Al-Fayed attended that. The paparazzi who stand potentially accused of at least manslaughter in the death of Diana uh, were interrogated intensively. So clearly despite the wishes of the British monarchy and the French establishment to have this case written off as tragic drunk driving the judge doesn't see it that way and furthermore executive intelligence review has published extraordinary documentation from literally the moment of the crash right. proving that the evidence far more points towards premeditated murder than any other explanation now I think it's very important to realize that the personality of Lyndon LaRouche has been a central figure in the fight that you referenced earlier among various factions of the British establishment. And the fact that after uh, many years of LaRouche being a pivotal player in that struggle, right. that now we're seeing overt slanders coming out against LaRouche indicates that we're truly moving into a very significant new moment in the fight within Britain and the controversy over the murder of Princess Diana. Four major slanders appeared in British media last week against Lyndon LaRouche, EIR, and EIR counterintelligence director Jeff Steinberg. Let's look at one of them now, part of a documentary which aired on Britain's Channel 4 last Thursday. Looking at something that really should not be characterized as a traffic accident case, but ought to be characterized as an investigation uh, into something that, in my view, looks like a murder. The idea of a plot has gained currency throughout the world. There are special conspiracy websites on the internet. In Egypt, a lawyer is taking Prince Philip and MI6 to court, accusing them of ordering a double contract killing. And the plot idea is endlessly promoted by Al-Fayed. 
Michael Cole, his spokesman who retired in February, suggested that we talk to this man. Jeffrey Steinberg, chief reporter for a US magazine called Executive Intelligence Review. He even believes that the preposterous Prince Philip theory could be true. Now I'm not saying that I've got anything even remotely resembling smoking gun proof that Prince Philip uh, called the shot and ordered British intelligence to do it, not by a long shot. But I'm saying that looking at his background, looking at the fact that several news reports indicated that he was livid over the idea of this relationship and was in fact livid over the fact that Diana had become a very significant thorn in the side of the House of Windsor. Uh, certainly creates a circumstance where uh, I can't rule it out, in all honesty. Tony, for the record, I was interviewed by Channel 4 TV uh, in April of this year uh, for more than two hours. Uh, I went through the entire evidence for the murder thesis. Uh, and it's very instructive that out of that entire two-hour interview, they chose to only air the segment dealing with Prince Philip. Interesting. Now, this gets to the heart of the controversy and why Lyndon LaRouche is presently at the very center of the battle over the future fate of the British establishment, the British oligarchy, and the House of Windsor. Right. In November 1994, uh, Lyndon LaRouche wrote two extensive essays that were included in a special EIR cover story report called The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor, in which we particularly documented the murderous role of Prince Philip, the royal consort, in Africa and in many other parts of the world. Right. We who, would, who would want to kill Diana and Dodie? Let me who just... would benefit? Give me a motive. Let's just go along with uh, what Michael Cole might be saying, whatever his, his opinions are, and the Jeffrey Steinberg school of thought, and this was, uh, this was something to do with the security services. Who would sanction that? Well, it's nonsense. I think these conspiracy theories are frankly ludicrous. Why have the French authorities over, I, mean, I think, I think J Jeffrey Steinberg mentioned earlier on, nine, ten months this has been going on, and they have so signally failed to trace this well, car? Why do you say they failed? Why do you say they failed? You haven't seen what, what they're doing. Well, where Just is the car? Just because they failed to put a report on the table that satisfies you. The fact is that conspiracy theory is highly commercial. Conspiracy theory. So now you're a... You're a noted conspiracy theorist yourself. Why can't you get out of 007 land? Welcome to a very special edition of EIR Talks, dedicated to the death of Britain's Princess Diana. It's June 11th, 1998. My name is Tony Pappert, and our guest today is EIR Counterintelligence Director Jeff Steinberg, who's an internationally recognized authority on the death of Princess Diana, Diana last year. We're going to cover the story in five parts. First of all, the ongoing controversy today. Second, what really happened in the tunnel under Paris last year. Third, the question of motives. Fourth, the cover-up. And last, what comes next. Jeff, I know there have been four major attacks against Lyndon LaRouche, EIR magazine, and you personally in major British media over the past week. The occasion was competing TV broadcasts on the murder of Princess, or on the death of Princess Diana, which have revived deep political fissures in London over just what happened in Paris last August and what should be done about it. You were there. Please tell us about it. Well, I was in, Par uh, I was in London and in Nottingham, England, uh, last week at the invitation of uh, Independent Television Network, which on Wednesday night, June the 3rd, aired a one-hour documentary presenting some rather dramatic new evidence suggesting that Princess Diana, Dodi Fayed, and Henri Paul were murdered through a sophisticated vehicular homicide attack and were not merely the victims of the alleged drunk driving by Henri Paul. Now, uh, after that documentary, which was seen by more than 12 and a half million British